speaker for the first part of the session is um, Bob Gray. Uh, professor Gray is emeritus and he's also a recent professor at um, Stanford. Uh, he's currently a research professor uh, at, um, at Boston University. And uh, he's also somebody who's always been there for all of us in information theory. So thank you. Been around a long time. <laughs> That's not what I meant, but yes, you have. <laughs> Great. And this is the clicker. That's the clicker. Just don't okay. click that one or it'll turn everything off. Just okay. <laughs> I guess I should follow suit and to ensure I don't forget, the plug I, the book I'll plug is Edmund Berkeley and the Social Responsibility of Computer Ref Professionals by Bernadette Longo, which I discovered while preparing this talk and am now having very good email exchanges with her. Uh, to target my audience, how many of you had ever heard of Edmund Berkeley before seeing the title or abstract? Okay, if you're a computer scientist, hold your hand up again. If you're a computer scientist, put your hands down. <laughs> okay, thanks. That gives me an idea. Computer scientists usually are more literate than information theorists like me, and I'd assume the general public. Um, so this, okay. Okay. I get over enthusiastic and lose track of time. Let me find my timer. Just to remind me, I have to wrap up. Okay. Um, why the way the title was phrased? Well, the point of the symposium is Bull Shannon, and Berkeley is sort of a side story. But it involves both Bull and Shannon. I was asked to give this talk from the point of view of an information theorist, but as I mentioned in the abstract, I'm really giving it from the point of view of a former 13-year-old boy, uh, which whom who received, as I will explain, a device that he had designed with the help of Claude Shannon at age 13, along with a copy of Shannon's 1938 classic paper, which has already been mentioned. Namely, he was sending Shannon's work to 12 to 14-year-old boys. Um, so I'll talk a bit about that impact. Also, you can see that he's holding not a circuit board, but one of the more ancient of the digital computing machines. His book, which helped make him famous, 1949, I'll talk a little bit more about later, really is the book that popularized large computers to a pretty general audience. Not everybody, but it also brought Claude Shannon fame within the computing machinery um, community. There is kind of a legend that Shannon produced that paper in 38, and all of a sudden, everybody doing computing figured out that Boolean algebra was important. Well, that was sort of true for everybody doing computing at Bell Labs, but really he had very little impact outside of Bell Labs throughout the 40s. And it's really thanks to Edmund Berkeley that he caught on and had a much bigger impact. Okay, Berkeley started out uh, going to Harvard in 1926. And much as you already know about Shannon, he discovered Bull. And I find it fascinating that he discovered him through a seminar that was given by George Burkhoff, which I know from most of my career as the guy, who, one of the people who proved the ergodic theorem, which is one of the bases of random processes, information theory, and communication theory, but he was also interested in symbolic logic. He recommended George Boole's book, you've already heard about, and Berkeley was very much enamored of it. And in fact, by the time he graduated in 1930, he gave a commencement speech about uh, modern methods of thinking, which was essentially the idea of combining mathematics with logic and coming to a wonderful, precise, and exact way about, of thinking about serious problems and making decisions intelligently. Um, he had a romantic idea of being a mathematician, but you will notice that 1930 is the year after the great stock market crash, 
And so he realized, being pretty poor, that he had to get a job. And so he got a job with his degree jointly in mathematics and um, in logic with an insurance company. And you may know, if you know about computer science history, that there were a lot of parallel threads heavily driven by various industries like the insurance industry and the banking industry, who actually had use for computing machines, knew what they wanted to do with them. And there were a lot of parallel developments that strongly represented each other, but early on were, by and large, independent. Okay, Paul Sh uh, pardon me, Claude Shannon at about this time goes to the University of Michigan. He also meets George Boole figuratively by taking a class in symbolic logic. And he finishes up in 1936 with degrees in EE and math, joint degrees but slightly different. 1934, Berkeley went to the Mutual Insurance Company. Um, and pardon me, he moved from Mutual to Prudential. He learned about the IBM punch card machines, which were used for producing the statistics that were used in actuarial tables. It was a form of computing machine. I don't know if you'd call it a computer, but it was at least related. And he realized that what it was doing could be probably improved by actually using Boolean algebra. And that was pretty much when he started doing his own personal research, which he was allowed to do by the company, eventually he was able to do it officially, um, looking for applications. One of the first applications he thought of was being able to validate contracts, but there were also things, I think a few of which have been mentioned already, like sorting and tabulating data, computing averages, uh, which is more numerical, but also here it was more uh, dealing with ideas or with symbols. There'll be a side story, and I guess I chose red on purpose because one of the things he did then was get married, and he went with his wife to tour Europe, and one of the places he went was the Soviet Union, where he actually took classes in summer school at Moscow University. Um, he also lived in a place called Knickerbocker Village in Manhattan, I think in the Lower East Side which had a sort of lefty reputation. People like uh, Julius Rosenberg and Ethel Rosenberg lived there. And as you can guess, this is sort of a time bomb waiting to happen lately, later, but it's also one of the interesting parts uh, about his life. Shannon starts graduate studies at MIT, works with Vannevar Bush on the differential analyzer, which is another one of the early big computing machines, and he saw within that machine the opportunity to possibly use Boolean algebra as a main means of simplifying the design of switching circuits or relay circuits. Relays are really a form of switches, and they were heavily used within the telephone network. Um, so this would influence his future actions. And for implementing Boolean equations. Okay, there are two things there I'll try and point out right now, so I don't forget later. This is a two-way street. He's talking about possibly using Boolean algebra to design computing machinery, which will compute and do stuff that you usually think of as numerical stuff. But on the other hand, Boolean algebra is a symbolic logic. You can use it to consider things like insurance clauses and contracts and algorithms and other kinds of decisions. And you can take your Boolean algebra and implement it in the switching circuits. So you can use it to design the other, or you can use it to implement the other, both ways. And really, that was inherent in Shannon's early work. And that's something that I think Berkeley is one of the first to realize <laughs> and how important it's going to be. His master thesis, which was already um, mentioned, I'll come back to in a bit and show you a first page, not from his thesis, but from the paper that was published. His thesis was a year early. The paper was a bit polished to that. And I guess my first acquaintance with Shannon, as I'll mention later, is in 1956 at age 13. Um, my one Gaelic word of the day will be, I was born on Samhain in 1943. Um, so. 
Anyway, this, this paper has been very important to me, and I'll say more as I go along. Okay, 1937-38, Berkeley is publishing in, in the insurance profession journals, papers promoting Boolean algebra and its use for various applica applications, including here evaluating risk and um, quantifying rules for writing policies, perfect application for things that involve symbols. 1939, the complex number calculator by Stibitz mainly, um, was first put into operation at Bell Labs. Berkeley heard about it, went and visited it, and um, saw it in action. And Stibitz knew of Shannon's work, but this machine didn't have anything to do with Shannon's work, didn't have anything to do with uh, Boolean algebra, and again, um, Berkeley's attitude was, why not? 1940, Berkeley was introduced by writing, basically by correspondence to Claude Shannon, by Alonzo Church, who was an early pioneer computer scientist. And 1941, Shannon joins Bell Labs, and Berkeley's continuing his correspondence with him all this time. And he's learned about Shannon's applications of Boolean algebra to switching machines. He's got a copy of the paper, and he's seen it. And then he actually goes to talk with both Stibitz and with Shannon in 1941. And I should mention here, there was a Russian competitor that, who was mentioned who had done some of the connections of Boolean algebra. There was also a Japanese. Uh, scientist who, strangely enough, uh, the year after Shannon's paper appeared, came to visit Bell Labs. Um, the summary I've seen is that they deserve credit for independently making some of these connections, but Shannon is, the, is certainly the one for, at least in the English language, getting it out there and publishing it and having people understand it and really making initial use of it not in computers, really, but in switching networks like the telephone network, because that was the business Bell was in, and Bell didn't like to fund things that didn't have to do with the telephone network. So that was definitely the emphasis. OK, at that point, Berkeley decides to do a little bit of what Lewis Carroll tried to do. Um, and I would be curious in learning from any of our Irish visitors a question that came up in a conversation before this. Did Carol and Bull ever meet? Were they close enough in age? Um, anyway, I don't know the answer to that. OK. So Berkeley knew about Lewis Carroll, and he decided that all of this stuff really needed popularization because nobody knew about it. And he was mainly in the insurance business, but they were participating actively in really the dawn of the computer age, which was happening at that time. So he was very much involved with other, what we would now call computer scientists, and he took that on as sort of a, a life mission. Okay, um, he invited Shannon and Stibitz to come visit Prudential and talk about the possible applications of Stibitz's machine to insurance style applications. And it looked very promising, but it fell through completely for a lot of reasons. Um, the war is coming up. Bell was a little leery of getting into the computer building business, it was not promoting doing that. And so it fell through. Um, 1942, Berkeley joined the US Naval Reserve, was almost immediately sent off to Harvard where he joined the computation lab, and under Howard Aiken, uh, became very involved with the, I always have to read it, the automatic sequence controlled calculator, better known as the Harvard Mark I. So he was much involved with uh, other early luminaries like Grace Hopper, um, and he was actually involved somewhat in the design of the Mark II. But then his time ended there, and he left. Um, Burl, the, the quote at the bottom is ba basically that Berkeley really came to understand then that these computing machines coupled with Boolean algebra meant that they weren't tied to numbers. They could be used for more than just computing stuff. 
They were mostly then used for computing stuff. Almost none of them were used in a way to handle symbols, but that was all possible. And so that added to his desire to continue doing that. Um, 46, Berkeley finished his military duty. He stayed a reserve officer. I think he was a lieutenant commander of the time. And he went back to Prudential, continued his research work, continued looking on how to apply Boolean algebra, symbolic logic to computing machines. And he was very active in the early conferences of the day. So he was meeting other people like Vannevar Bush, I think even Norbert Wiener was involved to some extent, and George Burkhoff was involved at the time. In fact, there was a meeting, I think, in 1940 where the uh, complex number machine was demonstrated at Dartmouth, where they would come up with a problem, they would telephone it to the girl computers at Bell Labs, who would type it into the machine, who would get the answer, who would telephone it back. But even with all of that extra stuff, it was still enormously faster than if they just had humans do the computations. In 1947, Berkeley took a side, well, he actually started it a year earlier, a side trip in that instead of looking at these big machines, he looked at a little small machine that you could have in your home or have in your office. And it was pretty basic and pretty simple but it made it into uh, Scientific American in 1947. It was called Simon. Some people call it the first small, I wouldn't really call it a home computer, but it probably sold about 200 kits and people would build these things. Also then, and this is probably one of the things he's most known for, was he was a co-founder of the ACM, which when it was founded was the the NACM, the Northeast, I think, Association for Computing Machinery. And von Neumann's famous comment about it, because there was already the ancestors, the IEEE, the AIEE, and the IRE, and the uh, uh, mathematical associations where the computer machinery people were hanging out. But he saw this as purely for computing machinery professionals. And also they had certain goals built in from the start about having all of their research and other stuff being open and ensuring communications between all of these people. And I think his concern was that during the war years, it had been pretty much cut. And now he was worried about, um, I guess, basically the imminent Cold War and the increasing security fears of the government. Um, and they were trying to find ways to keep research out in the open so that the whole community, academic, industrial, and government, could survive with it. He left Prudential in 1948 to form his own company, eventually called Berkeley Enterprises. And the goals were there, and they're all things we've talked about. I should mention that Berkeley sort of considered computing machinery as a sort of robot. So he liked robots, including what we usually think of robots, along with just the computing. So that crops up a lot. But now the ominous stuff starts. The FBI decided to open files on all reserve military from World War II. That included Berkeley. So they started putting together all of these little facts that I'd mentioned. And he'd actually been interested in communism in 1930. Uh, he had visited the Soviet Union. He had associated with communist sympathizers. And he had actually associated with communist front organizations, things like the Spanish Refugee Fund and other anti-fascist organizations. So this was not brought public at the time being, but it was all on record. He presented a paper on symbolic logic and large-scale calculating machines at the ACM. ACM in its early days covered the technical stuff. It also had talks uh, about concerns about how computing machinery was being used, um, where the field was going, but it was pretty heavily technical. Um, and his book was published. Now his book was basically aimed at describing all of the really big machines that existed up to that point in plain English for a popular audience. But he also talked about Shannon. 
And he talked about the fact that there was this thing called Boolean algebra and that it was the way that you could actually design these machines and conversely implement things that you could do with Boolean algebra. Um, although that, I remind myself as I see it, was actually published in Science. And there's the comment which I won't read. But really, the computing machinery community did not know much about Shannon until about 1950, which is when he has these publications coming out in popular science kind of stuff and is really getting the ACM geared up. So really, from that time on, Boolean algebra became the lingua franca of computing. He founded and published the first computer magazine, so it's not really a journal. It's got magazine articles all over the map. And when nobody will write an article for him, he had a pseudonym, and he'd write them himself. <laughs> so one way, to, one way to publish it. He began discussions in 1954 with Shannon and a guy named David, David Hagelbeyer, Hagelbeyer, I think, who is obviously known to Berkeley because of the 38 paper, which he worships, but also because all of the mice running in mazes, the games, and more than that, Shannon and Hegelberger had planned, I don't know if they ever actually did it, putting together a little kit of a relay computer, which would do stuff like play the game of NIM, which crops up often in this, and other projects that related to uh, networks and related to computing machinery. So he asked Shannon if he had joined him to make a toy for the general public, and Shannon agreed. 1955, the first product came out, and I'll show you some photos in a moment, called Geniac. How many of you have ever heard of that? OK, how many of you have ever heard of Brainiac? either in this context or others. OK, that'll crop out in a moment. And the official name was Genius Almost Automatic Computer, but it's more often thought that it was really combining Genius with ENIAC, which was a famous computer at the time. He sold it through 1960, but really dropped off at about 1958, because the guy who was building it for him, his partner, went bankrupt formed a new company, decided to sell it himself without any permission from Berkeley. So you'll occasionally see more recent machines that have this guy's name, Oliver Garfield, on it. Um, and the original Geniac involved into Brainiac about 1958. And it took everything in Geniac, everything in a newer, smaller version of Geniac called Tinyac, and added to that, so it had hundreds of projects instead of just the 33 that the basic Geniac had. But the Geniac started it all. On a completely different note, he also received a memorandum from the Navy Security Board, I think it was called, um, basically saying that um, he was being accused of all sorts of alleged activities, most of which I've mentioned already. And asking him to resign from the Naval Reserve for security reasons. And basically, he got hit by McCarthy. He had the opportunity to appeal, which he did. Um, and it was based on these forms he was asked to fill out, five pages of questions about who did you, whom did you know, and when, and did you belong to, and name everybody you ever met who might have been part of this organization. Anyway, he appealed. He got called before a secret meeting of the Navy Security Board. You may remember the House of, of the House Committee on Un-American Activities. That was the public side of all of this. That's what Oppenheimer got put through. But a lot of scientists got put through the secret side, where basically they were guilty until proven innocent. They were not allowed to know who was accusing them. They were not allowed to know who the people were they were even associating with. And they were informed that the government assumed no liability whatsoever for anything that might happen to them uh, because of what they said. And he basically took the principled stance that he wasn't going to be a stool pigeon. And so he fought this for some time. But the end result was they said 
that if you resign your commission, you'll have an honorable discharge. If you don't, you're going to regret it. And he decided to, to go along with it and resign it. He still went on and became active in a variety of uh, peace organizations and anti-nuclear organizations, including the SANE organization. And then going back to the more fun part of the story, he had an article appear on him in Life magazine, which my parents subscribed to, and he an ad for Geniac cropped up in uh, Scientific American in September, and so I'm pretty sure that's why I asked for one and either got one on my birthday that I mentioned, or maybe it was on Christmas, but I think it was probably on my birthday. And I just found out last week that Marty Hellman, who's this year's Turing Award winner with Whit Diffie also got one at about the same time. He's about two years younger th than I am. He was a, is a prodigy. prodigy. And um, when he got it, his reaction was a little different. He was pretty disappointed. You may understand when I show you the photos. Because he knew what a real computer was, and this clearly wasn't. And it's often accused of being a toy. But I think it was an educational toy with a purpose. So there's a list of the stuff that came with it. I'll show you the photo. And of the 33 projects, uh, a third about were designed by Shannon. In fact, one of them, the combination lock, had been taken straight out of his 1938 paper. And many of the others had been taken out of his proposed uh, project kit for college classes dealing with relay computing machinery. OK, it also came with a copy of Shannon's paper, as I mentioned, which had been reprinted by Berkeley Enterprises. They kept reprinting it, I think, up until maybe the early 60s. So they did a real service of, of spreading Shannon around. OK, this is the Life article. And title has to do with robots, as I mentioned to you. And um, But let's just go, that's Geniac with a typically dressed teenager putting it together. <laughs> and you can see all of the ads that were uh, in the time, 1956. And then the picture on the left is the Scientific American ads. And I've actually found in my web research that th this was referred to as one of the first computing machinery music composers. You know, they took some statistics and then would put stuff together depending on what switches you put in. And somebody actually won a, uh, a prize for having implemented in hardware this thing that designed simple tunes. You can see there, there's no uh, harmony there. There's just the one line melody. Um, so these were the ads. And this was a machine, which probably is why Hellman was so bewildered. There was a, a lot of paperwork, bolts and uh, nuts and washers and a whole lot of wire. And this, these were the rotary switches, no relays. Well, that's one of the things Hellman complained about. He was expecting relays, but there weren't. And then the lights, which were basically the output. The input were these switches, which you could wire in all sorts of ways. And there were detailed wiring exams. That's also from a, the web, a computer history museum, I think. But that's more the way I remember it, which with the six wheels and the, and the row of lights. And here was, this is actually when I scanned my copy of the Shannon 38 paper, which I actually had through the year 2000. But I fear I lost it in our double, double move to Rockport after I retired. Um, it may still be in a pile somewhere in a box. But uh, I put in the box just. You can see what you've seen already is the postulates for a Boolean algebra. This is the binary, the, the two-valued Boolean algebra. And then from that, you would get all of the theorems, which you saw earlier, which are on, the, uh, on a later page. This was the beginner's manual. And I just wanted to point out right there that you're going to learn Boolean algebra. And that was part of his mission, was to teach it. And in fact, when I think the Tiny Act came out, it had almost an entire manual learn to, to learn it. Um, this was from the actual manual with some of the experiments based on Boolean algebra. So that's the equivalent of, of Shannon's postulates, again, dealing with only binary. I don't know if you can read this, um, but you will 
see a variety of things which can sort of sound like Shannon. Shannon did the NIM and the tic-tac-toe and the secret coder and secret decoder, another part of Shannon. Um, and the adding machine, that was in his college kit. Um, the silliest, I think, of all of them is the masculine feminine testing machine. It, it asks you questions like, who do you prefer, Marilyn Monroe or Liberace? Or, <laughs> or, or which do you prefer, shopping or hunting? So in, in, anyway, that one I have seen lampooned in a video on, on the web. But uh, again, a third of these really came from you know, Bell Labs input. Um, this is just to show you he did how do you automate the game NIM. And in particular, how do you automate it so the machine will win if you let it start? And I couldn't help but notice that this is written about 56. And then in 1958, out came an article on NIM, which I remember strongly, that was um, in Scientific American. And then even more so in college, seeing last year at Marienbad, where a big part of it is, if you're old enough or a film addict, was this guy keeps playing NIM, and this guy's wife is having an affair with this guy who keeps losing. And so there were a lot of discussions in the reviews about how can he keep winning like that? Is there some, well, all I had to do was go back and see Geniac or read Scientific American. Another application, model railroads. And now this is one I built with relays. I remember going out and buying the relays. Simple Boolean algebra kept multiple trains from hitting each other and kept them going on different loops. And um, its inputs were some switches and then sensors that were on the tracks, which would tell you where the things were. So that, that was just a personal thing. And th this is a Brainiac comment, because the same year that Brainiac came out from Berkeley, he appeared in DC Comics as an enemy of Superman. Berkeley took his time, but he eventually sued for copyright infringement. DC went along with it, and in one of those rare cases where there's a happy ending to suits, he modified the character so he's really a kind of living computer, an imitation man, and he put in plugs for Berkeley's machines. And so um, Brainiac has stayed in the vocabulary ever since. I see it all the time in the newspapers. Berkeley worked in the ACM, getting back to the other topic, on the Committee for Social Responsibilities of Computer Scientists, and of course, therefore, he was compute, accused immediately of being a communist, communist sympathizer. To speed up, I audited a class. My brother taught at San Diego State. Um, he had worked on Irma, which was the first banking computer built by GE in Menlo Park near Stanford. And um, he ended up teaching this class on digital computers. And the text was this book by Richards, who had been an IBM early computing pioneer. And the table of contents right there, Boolean algebra applied to computer components, switching networks and stuff. And again, on a personal note, um, that sounded kind of neat, so I did a science fair project on it. Didn't win anything, because I have zero artistic talent. And I remember it was pretty ugly. But it had drawings of a network of diodes and switches and maybe a transistor or two for the uh, NOT gate. And you sort of put in the initial input values. And there was a Boolean equation, which it solved. And the poster had an interpretation and the connection of logic. Um, so it was heavily based on what I'd learned with GENIAC and in my brother's class. Reading the, um, shortly thereafter, I went off to MIT. And this was my freshman elective, which did propositional logic, which is essentially symbolic logic. And I was reminded something I'd forgotten about. And that was that I was dealing with a Boolean algebra, not the Boolean algebra. That is, I was dealing with binary only. And actually, all of this worked if you had um, any set of stuff and simply had two binary operations and one unary operation, i.e., all of this is leading to one of the operations you can have is 
uni union intersection complementation, what you have is basic set theory, elementary set theory, and of course, Bull saw that and went on to do probability theory with that. So this is really what I was asked to do in the beginning, is you get into probability, hence also Shannon theory for the discrete case, but that's really where, using the right mathematics, you get the continuous case. So that was my history. The epilogue. Senator Thomas Dodd denounces the leadership of Sane in 1960, the same last year of the basic story, said it was full of commies, and he demanded that they find them all and kick them out and never allow any of them in again. Berkeley fought that hard as they wanted to allow anybody who wanted to be a member of the, uh, uh, of the Association for Computing Machinery should be allowed to. He lost that battle. Um, in a way, he got vengeance in 1972. He was recognized as a founder of the ACM and asked to give a talk at their silver anniversary. And he denounced all of the people working in the computer industry who had designed and built the machines that killed people in the Vietnamese War. And a substantial portion of the audience got up and walked out. The legend is Grace Hopper led that walk out. And she had been a very close friend of Berkeley many years before when they'd both been with Howard Aiken. Okay, if I just, I'll just flash the pages. This is better news. This is the first Shannon lecture in Eshkelon, Israel. And I thought you'd like to see a photo of Shannon you hadn't seen before. And I like to show this picture because oddly enough, this is my wedding reception. <laughs> my wife and I had been married in secret and this guy on the far left, Lee Davison, knew about it, and with a friend, they organized a surprise party. So of course, Shannon got swept into it. You can see the glass of wine in his hand. He did probably have a little bit too much to drink, was not able to sleep very well. He was seen wandering the halls late at night, but still gave an incredible lecture, if somewhat hungover, the next morning. And this talk comes from a talk I gave in 2000 at the unveiling of the Claude Shannon statue in his home down of Gaylord. We had a panel of information theorists trying to tell the locals what Shannon had actually done <laughs> and, and why he was so famous. And this is Betty Shannon. And Dave Newhoff drove Betty to, I think, the Detroit airport. And I was along for the ride because I was going to the University of Michigan. She had burst out laughing and grinned during my talk when I mentioned Edmund Berkeley. And she told all these marvelous stories how he lived nearby and he was coming over to the house all of the time, pestering Claude Shannon about the machine, its design, about the projects. And Shannon, being very kind and generous, put up with him. But she thought Berkeley was just a really annoying crank, but interesting. I'll let you read this. I think it's a perfect description of uh, Berkeley and just capturing the fact that he worried about what people were going to do with all of this new technology. And I, I saw kind of a ring of some of these concerns and things that have been said about Bull and that he wanted the people working in the industry to realize the implications of what they were doing and to try and have an impact on where it was that they were going. And that he was a teacher. I think he probably taught more people Boolean algebra than anybody, any other single person. And that is still having some of an effect. These were my primary sources, which I'll just leave on there. I showed you uh, Bernadette Longo's book. And my exchange with her has led her to get interested in the alumni of GENIAC and how many of them had technical careers thereafter. Um, even the ones who were disappointed by the machine, like Marty Hellman, seem to have. And with that, I thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>